All right, everyone calm down. It's still tropical themed. We're, it's, we got a little shark, bro. We're good. 12 years ago, the stunning conclusion. Is stunning the right word? Well, I was certainly stunned by how much I hated what I was reading. Anyways, the stunning conclusion of the Twilight Saga released, which of course was Breaking Dawn. And I remember reading this through the night with increased confusion and anger and dismay until I ultimately wanted to chuck the book out the window. And that was kinda it for me with Twilight. I hadn't been huge on Eclipse because I'm not teen Jacob, and pregnancy frankly disgusts me, so Breaking Dawn was just not a good time at all. But years later, the movies released and they had the added benefit of being kind of funny. Actually, pretty damn funny. I still don't necessarily know if it needed to be split into two pieces, but part one literally ends up being half wedding, honeymoon, and sex, and then half literal body horror. <laughs> It's hilarious. So I figured that since we've all kind of been back on the Twilight train a little bit in 2020, especially where Midnight Sun just came out, that I would give the Breaking Dawn novel another chance. So I touched on some stuff from the Breaking Dawn movie in my overall Twilight video that I released a year ago, but we're gonna be going in on the book, the changes the movie made, a little bit on the legacy of the series and the infamy of Chuck Esme and all the glory that comes with it. So first off, I just wanna say I definitely did not hate this as much as I did the first time I read it. Probably because at this point, I just accept this franchise for what it is and I'm not seriously expecting a solid resolution to the series. So instead of getting mad, I can just really appreciate all the hilarious aspects of it. But the reread revealed some forgotten treats, some clarified horrors, so let's get into it. Again, if you love Breaking Dawn, I'm not trying to shit on you. These are just my thoughts, my opinions, you can disagree. And I'm glad that you got your satisfying conclusion. So because we're jumping ahead right to the last book, Eclipse actually ends with Edward agreeing to make Bella a vampire and even sleep with her as long as she marries him. I'm sure there's some young marriage agenda against premarital sex thing going on here, but whatever, it's fine, they're in love. But the book starts with Bella driving her fancy new car through town that Edward insists she drives until she becomes a vampire and then she'll get her after car. Spoiler alert. It's a Ferrari that she never drives. But she ends up finding out that this before car is actually an unreleased Mercedes Guardian, which is missile proof and typically for diplomats and drug lords. And just the thought of her driving around this tiny town with a missile proof car is hilarious to me. Like if anything, that would just put her at more risk. But we find out that Jacob's essentially run away since he found out about the wedding. And Charlie, Bella's police chief dad, is not necessarily any happier about the situation and honestly thinks that she's pregnant. Which is just some sick foreshadowing, isn't it? Now in the movie, they're kind enough to give this line to Anna Kendrick so she can just have one last sassy send off before we go full tilt into our dramatic conclusion. I think Bella's gonna be showing. Jess, she is not pregnant. Okay, let's get to married at 18. And again, more than ever, thanks to the novelized versions, I am hyper aware of Alice's affections for Bella. And I hold out on them being my OTP. I don't care if that's totally against Stephanie Meyer's views. I hold out. Because when they're getting ready for the wedding, she goes up Bella's dress to affix the garter. Look, I get it. They're just close gal pals. Whatever. They get married, it's a beautiful affair. The movie includes some great wedding toast, but I can't imagine laughing at Charlie saying he'll hunt Edward to the ends of the earth with a gun, especially since as far as the Cullens are aware, she is gonna disappear. But I feel like in these videos, I often neglect Emmett, who's absolutely hilarious. And when he's introduced in the first movie, he is walking into the cafeteria with a bag full of what I assume is hard boiled eggs. But yeah, he ends up dropping this banger of a double entendre. Bella, I hope you've got enough sleep these last 18 years, because you won't be getting any more for a while. But everyone's crying. Bella is saying her final goodbyes. They're about to head off on a beautiful honeymoon to some mysterious island that Carlisle bought for Esme, who are... Edward's pseudo parents. But before they can leave, Bella's big wedding gift arrives and Jacob is back. And it's all going mostly well until Bella lets slip that Edward and her do in fact plan to consummate 
the wedding before she's a vampire. So you know, when he's still an impossibly strong murder machine and she's just a mushy flesh body. So Jacob obviously freaks out cause he's like, he's literally going to smoosh you to death. Are you stupid, Bella? So he gets pissed and has to be pulled away by the wolves. And then Bella and Edward take off on their magical island adventure. After the sanctity of marriage is confirmed, they smoosh. And while Edward didn't kill her, he did leave her black and blue and basically destroyed the entire bedroom. And yes, they did show that in the movie. And now suddenly because she enjoys sex so much, she's like, hey, maybe we don't have to turn me into a vampire so immediately. I wanna feel these feelings for way longer, so maybe I will actually go to Dartmouth University. Cause her major concern is that once she's a newborn vampire, her blood lust will be the most important lust to her. And I'm weird, I would have been totally fine with Big Cullens on campus. That sounds delightful to me. So she actually starts getting excited about going to school, having more time with her parents, but then she starts getting morning sickness. Yes, that's right, morning sickness. And starts to freak out when she realizes she hasn't had her period yet. And then notices a little bump far too quickly on her stomach in the movie. This is pretty much just a regular stomach. I love the bit when Kristen reveals that she, that she thinks she's pregnant for the first time. Yeah. And she's like, oh my God, and she looks at her completely flat stomach. Yeah. But then she feels something move inside her. I'm out. I'm done. So yeah, she's pretty damn sure she's pregnant. Okay, so let's do some science here. Vampires can't produce tears or any kind of bodily fluid. So how can they? You know what? Never mind. I'm not a vampire scientist and I don't need to think about these things. So Alice calls because she sees some weird shit and Edward goes a bit catatonic and snaps out of it long enough to be like, Carlisle, what the fuck? Well, at least no one assumes she cheated. That's nice, because this little sucker's wiggling around already. So at first Bella's like, oh, it's so sweet. He's just so worried about me and the baby that he wants to get me right back to Carlisle so he can make sure everything goes smoothly. But all too soon realizes that Edward's more like, yeah, we gotta get that little shit out of there. So Bella calls Rosalie. One of the Cullens that dislikes Bella because she wants to give up her humanity because Bella knows that Rose will 100% prioritize the baby over Bella's well-being. How sweet. And then something highly unusual happens. After 138 pages of weddings, sex, and honeymoons, the whole book switches to Jacob's perspective. And this annoyed the hell out of me 12 years ago because I needed to know what was gonna happen with that little demon spawn and I was not team Jacob. Now I'm not team Jacob or team Edward. I'm team Alice, which is neither here nor there. Now rereading this, I actually forgot it flipped to Jacob's perspective so early on, but I do remember being annoyed by it up until a certain point where Jacob Jacob was one of the only people not acting like a crazy person until he started acting like a crazy person. But it basically just shows that he's perpetually miserable because a bunch of the other wolves have imprinted, which means they found their perfect match slash person they need to protect above all else. But the issue here is that they can imprint on anyone of any age. I have yet to see one of them imprint on someone significantly older, but I've definitely seen them imprint on someone significantly younger. And over the years, this has been debated by fans and non-fans alike, that if they imprint on someone younger, it's just a protector role. But rereading the book really removes any room for confusion, regardless of how they may feel when that child is still a child. So Jacob meets up with Quill and he's hanging out with a little girl who at most is three. And you guessed it, Quill has imprinted on this baby. Now for the moment, he is in fact just taking care of her, protecting her, and keeping her safe. But then Jacob says, though I did think it sucked that he had a good 14 years of monkitude ahead of him until Claire was his age, for Quill at least it was a good thing werewolves didn't get older, but even all that time didn't seem to bother him much. I know when it comes to Edward, I said I'm gonna try to give it to them because when you get turned into a vampire, you get frozen mentally and physically at the age you turn, so he is physically and mentally 17. There's a whole laundry list of problems with Bella and Edward's relationship before you even get to the age thing. But the big difference is that Edward didn't meet Bella when she was a baby. Like this is grooming. There's no way around it. Jacob's even like, Quill, you ever thought about dating? I asked, huh? You know, a real girl. I mean, just for now, right? On your nights off babysitting duty? Quill stared at me, his mouth hanging open. Like what happens here? Does something just like flip in the brains when they hit a certain age? And it's like, yes, it is now perfectly okay for me to pursue a romantic relationship with you when I've spent your entire life raising you. Also, how does this work as a guaranteed two-way thing? Like what happens if the imprintee doesn't want anything to do 
with the imprinter. Either way, that's that's weird to me. And it's also foreshadowing for later. So Jacob's basically just been waiting to hear what kind of story the Cullens were gonna come up with to explain what happened to Bella. Because he knows the two scenarios are either Edward accidentally kills her or she becomes a vampire. And then the wolves hear some whispers that Bella's back in town but with a mysterious illness. And Jacob's like, I think that mysterious illness is vampirism. And he's like, cool, time to go murder the Cullens. They broke the treaty. Doesn't matter that that's what she wanted and the Cullens have never heard a single human the entire time they've been here. Murder them all. But the wolves are like, yeah, no. So he heads off to do it himself. And then he realizes, wow, she really is sick. And here's where our body horror starts. This fetus has been rapidly growing, leaving her black and blue from the inside. She's throwing up regularly. Her bones are poking through her skin because it's literally draining her from the inside. And no one can do anything because Rosalie's acting as her personal bodyguard. And he's like, wow, oh shit, she's somehow pregnant. Pregnant. And before he can really be concerned about her safety, he's just pissed off at the thought of Edward being inside her. And honestly, Jacob sucks. He never takes Bella's choices into account. He always says he knows what's best for her and that he'd be better for her. So obviously, Jacob's ready to rip Edward apart. And he's also just super confused as to why no one's removed the fetus if it is killing Bella. But it's because Bella's the one who won't let anybody do anything. And this part in the movie also goes like pretty pro-life with its arguments. Alice is like, the fetus is killing Bella. And Rose Rosalie is just like, say it, Alice, it's just a baby, just a little baby. But hey, it's Bella's choice and it's fiction. Edward wants Jacob to talk some sense into her, but Edward's view of sense in the book is a little bit weird. Instead of him realizing that Bella wants the baby because it's his baby, he's like, I had no idea how badly she wanted to be a parent, so I need you to offer your services to make a safe one with her. And he definitely didn't mean as an unattached sperm donor. Ooh. Oh, no, no, no. I don't care about anything but keeping her alive, he said, suddenly focused now. If it's a child she wants, she can have it. She can have half a dozen babies, anything she wants. He paused for one beat. She can have puppies, if that's what it takes. Guys, I don't think Stephanie's okay. And Jacob's obviously like, are you insane? Gonna rent her out for the weekend? Stud services? No way. But maybe, and starts fantasizing about it. And at least he knows she isn't gonna go for for it, but he still makes the offer. And if it doesn't work and she dies, he gets to kill Edward. So the movie was smart enough to leave all that stud service stuff out. So he goes to talk to her, obviously doesn't work. There's a real fun, awkward back and forth where Bella doesn't understand what he's saying when it comes to her getting pregnant a different way. But then he ultimately gets too enraged with her nonchalance of the situation and just rage phases to Wolf and Bales. And now suddenly the whole pack knows and they are very afraid of this potential murder machine. So now Jacob's the one who's not willing to kill anyone unless Bella dies first. And it's the rest of the pack that's like, this is an abomination. It won't be able to control itself. We need to kill it. They are 100% going to murder Bella. The protectors of human life indeed. But Jacob and Seth, who actually likes the vampires after the events of Eclipse, are like, hell no. But then Sam pulls his ultimate alpha card to force them to submit against their will. But then Jacob's like, wait, I'm the rightful alpha. I just let you have it because I didn't want the responsibility, but I don't have to do shit. So he breaks off from the group to go warn the vampires. Seth goes with him and is now part of their own little pack. And then Seth's sister Leah ends up showing up too. And Leah is the only female werewolf who had been in a relationship with Sam before the shape-shifting thing started. And once it did, Sam imprinted on someone else. Can you imagine? And now she gets to share a mental link with all the other werewolves while she still loves him. And they wonder why she's a little bitter. But this heads up stops the wolf pack because they've now lost the element of surprise. Anyways, after Bella starts to progressively waste away even more, and then they get to do one of my favorite things, intense vampire baby research on Yahoo. There's a lot of books in the Cullen household, but know what to expect when you're expecting a half vampire child. No, they look on Google images. <laughs> that was one of the, the funniest scenes I've ever had to do in my life. We were all like 100, 300 year old geniuses. And we just go, it's like vampire baby. Like <laughs> on Google images. I can't find anything. They finally realized that, hey, if the baby is like half vampire, maybe it's craving blood. So maybe we should be feeding Bella blood. And would you look at that? 
it worked. How the hell no one thought of that beforehand is beyond me. We got a freaking vampire specialist and doctor here. So the fetus keeps growing and breaks one of Bella's ribs and Jacob is hanging out downstairs when Alice comes to talk to him and he's like, hey, why aren't you upstairs? I thought you and Bella were like this. And you wonder why I shipped them. Okay, not the time. But Alice is like, the fetus is kind of like you. I can't see it. So when I'm around Bella, it makes her blurry, which gives me a headache. So now Alice is sad because she can't be near Bella and that makes me sad. And when another break happens later, Jacob notes that it's not just he and Edward that are burning over the situation. Alice loves Bella too. Not the time, Amanda. Another highlight of this section is Jacob making a bunch of dumb blonde jokes to Rosalie and her turning a bowl into a doggy dish for him. Anyways, it hits a point where they're pretty close to delivery time. And by delivery time, I mean biting their way through the membrane to get it out. Time. And this is right around when Edward realizes that he can hear the baby's thoughts. That it loves Bella, doesn't want to hurt her, and can understand them when they try to tell it not to move around too much. And this is the moment that Jacob loses Edward in this horrifying situation. Freaks out and Edward tells him to take the Aston Martin so he doesn't wolf out. So he drives all the way to Seattle to try to find another girl to imprint on so he doesn't have to care about Bella anymore when this little vampire spawn bursts out of her stomach. So he's just obsessively checking all these different girls that he's walking by before a girl ends up approaching him and oh my god she's funny and likes cars and he feels nothing sorry lizzie with the gold red hair and pale skin you're not bella what a weird little aside for this story like the way that this book is written is honestly kind of weird obviously pretty much everything that happens with jacob separately gets left out of the movie because it kind of doesn't work with the consistent thread of this being the end of the bella edward romance story but he heads back just in time to witness Bella vomit a fountain of blood because it's baby time. So I guess like when you're giving birth to a vampire demon spawn, uh, your water doesn't break, uh, your blood bursts. Obviously the movie omitted the blood fountain and replaced it with everybody's favorite blood shake drop scene. <laughs> So Carlisle isn't back yet, so Rosalie and Edward have to bite it out. Rosalie obviously gets bloodlust, Jacob dives across the table at her, and we go full horror here, even in the movie. There's cracking noises, horror trills, there's flashing lights, Bella is dying from blood loss, there's blood everywhere, a baby is literally being bitten out of her stomach. I honestly can't believe how intensely they committed to this scene and still got the PG-13 rating. And then finally, it's out, and they named it Renesme as a combination of Renee and Esme. And Bella insists on holding the little bundle of joy, even though she's bleeding out and the damn thing latches onto her breast, not for milk, but for blood. This is absolutely horrifying. For something that definitely seems to be about carrying a baby to term regardless of how it puts mother at risk. Yes, it's Bella's choice, but this is doing a great job reaffirming my total disgust and horror at pregnancy. So Edward pumps a syringe full of his venom straight into her heart and then starts biting her all over just to really make sure that venom gets in there. But instead of the expected pained screams, she just doesn't move. Versus what happened to her with this bite in Twilight. So Jacob thinks Bella has died and follows this pole downstairs. And then he sees Renesme, and he's about to kill this little CGI monstrosity. And then the gravity of the earth no longer tied me to the place where I stood. It was the baby girl in the blonde vampire's arms that held me here now, Renesme. The imprints on the baby. Wee woo, wee woo, officer. But I get it, he's just gonna be her protector for now. And this is just the first of many horrific CGI baby shots, but we'll get back to the legend of Renesme soon. Cause now we're in book three, back to Bella. In the movie, we at least get the added benefit of the wolves and the vampires fighting a little bit until they reveal the imprint. Jacob imprinted, they can't hurt her. It's their most absolute law. So Bella's been asleep for about two days and they think it's the morphine that they administered beforehand that stopped her from screaming, but she's aware of the extreme pain and she's just working super hard to hold it together. And the movie shows her body going back together, like literally her chest just snaps back up like someone stuck an air pump in her stomach. But after a beautiful sequence of memories of her human life, she wakes up. And in the book, she does a backflip off the bed when she notices that Edward doesn't feel as cold as she should, which they sadly did not include in the movie. 
Y'all can do body horror, but you can't do backflip off a of bed, Bella. Okay. Anyway, she obviously wants to see her kid, and they're like, mm, maybe you should, uh, you know, take care of that whole bloodthirst thing before we uh, let you see a half human. And it seems like Bella just might have been born to be a vampire, because other than her little backflip and some moments of anger, she's in extreme control. Even manages to run away from some humans while hunting. And in the movie, this is a 10 out of 10 moment of Bella scaling up the side of a mountain with her nails. So they get back and she's ready to hold her baby. And that's when she realizes that Renesmee has the ability to put memories into people's head by touching them. So now it's time for a little bit of a history lesson on the horrors of Renesmee. So there's the very obvious CG disaster baby. Like when they said that Renesmee was supposed to be like one of a kind and kind of otherworldly and unreal looking. I think she's still supposed to look real. But the reasoning behind the CGI is actually kind of worse. Producer Wig Godfrey says that because they were going for something otherworldly with Renesmee, they needed this kid to look like a baby, but also express intelligence and look more mature than a one day old. So they got a real baby and CGI enhanced it. And I can assure you the result is not very intelligent looking. And then they just use de-aging technology to use the face of the oldest version of Renesmee we see and like put it on all the other versions of her and it's, it's just, no. But before the bad CGI, my goodness, we get art and that art is Chuck Esme. You're my sweetie pie. Now, if you're familiar with the channel, you've probably seen Chuck Esme pop up a couple times, but Chuck Esme is the name given to the 60 pound mechanical doll that was originally supposed to be Renesme, and it is horrifying. Like, look at this thing. It now lives in a Twilight Museum where it apparently might break out of its display case to roam around at night, and she's always just in different positions. And when I'm rich, I will own it. But back to Bella holding the little bundle of joy. So Jacob won't really let Renesme go and is getting agitated at Bella holding holding her and all too quickly she realizes this sick son of a bitch imprinted. And he's like, no, it's not like that. This is what you wanted. You said we belonged in each other's lives and this is how. And again, just to drive home that it's an eventual relationship thing, Bella says, you think you'll be part of my family as my son-in-law? Good, good, good grooming. And then she attacks the shit out of him. You nicknamed my daughter after the Loch Ness Monster? <laughs> But it's fine, she calms down after accidentally hurting Seth. But it's finally time for Bella and Edward to have some alone time. And she's like, wow, I can't believe I wanted to stay a fragile human forever. I didn't lose any of my emotions and now we can really f And the movie makes this one of the most artistic sex scenes I've ever seen in a PG-13 movie. And Bella's like, wow, how is the rest of your family not doing this all the time? And Edward's basically like, well, there's a lot of free time when you don't have to sleep. And that's when he's basically like, the reason I know so much isn't because I can read mine, it's because I've just had a lot of free time to read. Basically, Edward is smart because he had no one to smoosh. So if you're also like Edward Cullen with no one to smoosh and want to fill all your waking hours with learning, do I have a deal for you with today's sponsor, Audible? Audible is a leading provider of audiobooks and spoken word entertainment with thousands, yes, thousands of titles to choose from. So if you want to get your twilight on, they have you covered. Want to continue to experience the existential dread that Charlie Kaufman slammed into you with I'm thinking of ending things? With Audible, you can listen to the original story by Ian Reid, which I've really been enjoying so far. Audible has actually been one of the most useful resources to this channel for any video that I've made about a book, including this one. Their massive selection lets me listen to things while I'm exercising, running errands, driving long distances, doing chores. And if fiction isn't your fancy or you just want to learn new things. They have a variety of other options from biographies, educational, comedy, and business. They even have podcasts. As an Audible member, you get one credit that you can use on any title in their catalog, including new releases, and you can keep them forever. And get full all-you-can-listen-to access to their new Audible Plus program, which features all their Audible originals. And right now, if you head on over to audible.com slash Jedi or text Jedi to 500-500, you can start a 30-day trial and get all of things I just mentioned for free. So click the link in the description box down below to start your free trial today. And Jacob is now in the process of destroying all the goodwill I had for him because he goes behind everyone's back to tell Charlie that Bella's around because they were talking about going to New Hampshire and that just didn't work with Jacob's schedule. So this actually would have been the main part I would have wanted from Jacob's perspective in the book. But thankfully the movie did not deprive us of Jacob going to visit Charlie and dripping down into his skivvies to show him the wolf stuff. 
What the hell are you doing? So they basically treat Charlie as he needs no basis. He knows what's up with Jacob, but he doesn't know the specifics about the Cullens. And Jacob was like, no, I didn't do this to hurt you. Now that I've reprojected my affections for you onto your infant child, I can love you the right way as a friend now. So then we get a scene where they have to try to teach her how to act like a human again. Maybe a tad slower. And then they give her color contacts that aren't as nice as her regular eye colors because Alice specifically says, your brown was much prettier. So they try to go with like a niece adoption story for Charlie, but he very quickly realizes that Renesme has Bella's eyes, but he's just happy that Bella's okay. But things can't stay happy forever because Renesme is growing at an accelerated rate. So fast that they think she'll likely be an adult in four years. So they're all panicking that she's gonna die extremely young. So they plan to go down to Brazil to search into some myths to see if there's anything they can do. But before they can, Arena, one of the vampires from Alaska, comes to visit, but she sees Renesme from a distance and assumes that the Cullens have turned a child, which is an issue because as I've mentioned before, when vampires are turned, they stay stuck mentally and physically at that age. Meaning that you can never train these kids and a single temper tantrum will level a city. And this allowed the movies to provide one of the most iconic scenes of Dakota Fanning throwing a child into a fire. <laughs> And at first, they just assume that Arena's mad about the wolf, but eventually Alice realizes what she thinks she saw and that she's gone to the Volturi to report them for their crimes. So the full force of the Volturi are coming. And then it looks like Alice and Jasper abandoned the family, but how anyone could believe that is beyond me. She's obviously using her gift to help the best case scenario. And she left Bella a secret message for an address she needs to go to so that Bella would be able to protect it from other people because no one can get in her mind. But before she can go on that mission, the Cullens have to pull together a gang of vampires to act as witnesses that Renesme isn't an immortal child. So we get all sorts of exciting vampires. Vampires that can control the elements, make you see anything they want, Irish vampires. And this is how they figure out that Bella is a shield, which is why Edward was never able to read her mind. And why none of the other vampires' powers, like Jane's or even Kate's electricity here, have been able to work on her. Except for Jasper's mood manipulations, and Stephanie Meyer tried to say it was because that was like a physical effect, but wouldn't Kate's electricity also be a physical effect and not a mental one? I don't know, whatever. And she'll ultimately figure out how to project the shield outward so she can protect other people in battle. But they quickly realize that the Volturi are mainly coming in full force because they want to use this as a situation to get the vampires who have the powers they've been coveting for years like Alice's, which is why she left. So Bella finally gets to the address Alice left her and realizes it's for someone who can forge documents. In the book, Bella figures out on her own that the only way for Renesmee to be safe is to just send her with Jacob, but the movie kind of takes that away from her. Then it's Christmas and Jacob gives Renesmee a promise ring bracelet. But now we're getting to the biggest change between the book and the movie. So the Volturi arrive, the Collins plead their case, prove that Renesmee was biologically created. And we get this T1 performance from Michael Sheen. <laughs> really feeling the menace here. So the Volturi end up killing Arena for lying, but this is mainly just to try to spark some kind of emotion in people so that it'll start the fight. But Bella can now push out the shield so she's stopping Jane from attacking people with her pain powers. So then Arrow tries to start pushing the idea that Renezme might be very dangerous and they don't know what to expect, so they should probably eliminate that threat. So as they kind of realize that things aren't going well, they're about to send Jacob and Renezme off. Edward leaves us with this Marvelous line. Goodbye, Jacob, my brother, dot, 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 my son. Yo, your kid's still an infant. You don't have to be thinking about him as a son-in-law yet. Oh my God, that's hilarious. How did I forget that? But surprise, Alice shows up with evidence that the child won't be a risk. But in the movie, she lets Arrow touch her instead of just showing him the proof. So he should now be able to see what the plan is for Jacob and Renesmee's escape, which completely defeats the purpose. Anyways, like I said, major deviation here. Alice realizes that it doesn't matter what they're shown, they'll keep it up. So the fight starts, they pull Alice away, Carlisle goes to get her back and Arrow rips off his head. Then they kill Jasper, Emmett kills Alec, someone kills Seth, Leah sacrifices herself to save Esme, then Alice feeds Jane to Sam, which is a 10 out of 10 moment. And then finally, it ends with Bella and Edward double teaming Arrow. But then boom, surprise, it was all a vision in Alice's head of the worst case scenario. And this pissed people off. Like at this point, 
I didn't give a shit, but they clearly felt the need to add this in for the people who weren't in it for the vampire melodrama, which is honestly the only reason I'm here. Like the book, they just flat out find someone who was born like Renesmee that basically reached full maturity in the seven years, then stopped aging and posed no threat. In either situation, the Volturi are like, ah, oh, never mind, I guess there's no threat here. Guess we'll be leaving now. Caius is a little pissed off because he really wants to fight, but Arrow's like, hell no, we not dying today. And that's it. They all cheer. They all get to live happily ever after. Bella figures out how to push her shield aside long enough to let Edward see into her head and shows him how she's always seen him. And this is the melodrama that I signed up for. And now that Midnight Sun is done, she actually has plans for two other Twilight related stories. And I am just tickled waiting to see what they might be. But there's been a lot of debates over the years as to what the true intentions of the Twilight story were, which I think is people just looking into things too deeply. The biggest being that the entire franchise is secretly some kind of Mormon propaganda because yes, Stephanie Meyer, is a Mormon, and I'm sure that absolutely affects her writing and the themes that she puts into her stories, but I don't think she set out specifically to make some kind of story that would influence her readers into making certain life decisions. As far as I'm aware, there wasn't some massive conversion of Twilight fans to Mormonism, unless I'm completely wrong. And I'm not saying that there aren't any issues with some of the ideas expressed in this series. I think I've discussed some quite thoroughly in this video. And I've already gone over the issues with Edward's stalking and how it's a pretty unhealthy relationship all all around, but I can at least take it for what it is. Teen fiction speaks to teens, that all-encompassing infatuation and first love, it does feel as big as they make it out to be in these stories, which is why it's reflected in so many different stories aimed at teens, because that's a representation of their feelings. But again, if somebody breaks into your house and watches you sleep without your permission, that's not okay. <laughs> Overall, I just feel like this series is something that might not have necessarily been planned super thoroughly after the first one. I can still read the first Twilight and have a good time. I'm actually kind of excited to go back through New Moon for the first time in a while, just for myself, unless you guys want a video on that. Still Still don't really like Eclipse at all, but these movies are funny. But yeah, holy shit, some of that lore is just batshit. But that is gonna do it for today's video. Let me know what you guys are thinking in the comment section down below. Thank you as always to my Patreon supporters, anybody who's watching this video, subscribe to the channel. If you're new, leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. Hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay, and we'll catch you all later.